the sustainability management master's program you are answering one simple question do you care about your future generation you know if you care about your kids their kids their grandkids then you care about sustainability and a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world we have both part time and full time students our curriculum is 30 hours instead of thesis we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job but at the same time sustainability is not always everything about environment it also relates to the business they will take a sustainable business strategies course they will take a project management course most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure they will have to have a sustainability office if you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact so i'm very excited to be here i just mentioned to our moderator that i'll be happy to take questions during the course of this because i think it keeps it a little more interactive the good news is i also have four quizzes during the course of this so nobody sleep uh and i uh for those of you who are on youtube you can't really take the quiz very easily but maybe uh you'll be able to follow along and so the only thing is if there is a point if you're asking a question i'll ask you to kind of summarize and sum up because i do want to get through everything here feel free to call me robert uh so this is what we're going to talk about today in our presentation I want to give you a feel for uh the background behind in particular supply chain sustainability initiatives and what the business case question is in putting those initiatives in front of corp in a corporate context. Then I want to talk about this challenge around how do you identify what the issues are in terms of sustainability and social responsibility. Recording started throughout your supply chain. How do you do that? I'm going to give you some examples of supply chain sustainability strategies. Uh and I'm going to talk about metrics and measurement. The one thing I'm leaving out because I actually have a separate talk on it and it gets kind of technical and complicated is reporting on sustainability under the Global Reporting Initiative or the Carbon Disclosure Project. But let's just say if you're a corporate entity, you are today reporting to your investors, to your public to some sort of stakeholder group about what you're doing in sustainability and probably what you're doing in supply chain sustainability. So you've heard uh you know this is kind of an interesting journey it's not intentional there was no such thing as a masters in sustainability when I was in school probably wasn't even a masters in supply chain at that point something like get in the business school but probably not a masters program not that old but you know this is interesting that this evolution has happened uh i actually started as a lawyer so one of the things that we're going to talk about today is risk one of the things that companies focus on in sustainability and social responsibility is reducing risk so if you think about it lawyers are very risk averse people they're trained to be uh oh don't do this don't do that so it's an interesting part of my perspective that I bring to it and I've actually had to teach myself as I work with clients don't always focus on risk don't always focus on risk think about opportunities don't always say no so I did run a manufacturing company that was in deep doo doo uh when I got it for uh what I thought was going to be 5 years and I was there 11 years and I chair this uh committee of uh uh practitioners inside large corporations in the institute for supply management and they're all either chief sustainability officers or chief supply chain sustainability officers and I chair that committee so let's talk about the background and and so for people who are steeped in supply chain this is pretty obvious but I do want to give the context for sustainability and social responsibility because it's something different than what goes on in building sustainable buildings So supply chains are comprised of interrelated activities. So 
there are what I call, what a lot of practitioners call, nodes on a supply chain. And in Europe, supply chain means forward and backward, but in the U.S. it's generally backward, what comes before you. We use value chain here to mean the whole thing. But I don't care which way you're looking, upstream or downstream, there are other actors that do things, and they're interrelated because they either supply you or they are your purchasers, they purchase things. And in some cases, there are thousands. Before everybody entered the room, I talked about my colleague at Northrop Grumman who builds planes that have over a million parts. And he is the head of supply chain there, and they have 17,000 suppliers. So when you think about the sustainability challenge through that supply chain, the scale is something to remember. Um, three points. Every company is both a supplier and a customer except those folks that are all the way at the end. If I'm the extractives company, I don't have a lot of suppliers. I have equipment suppliers and some finance people and that sort of thing. But I'm really supplying everybody downstream. Um, and product lifestyle, we call something cradle to gate or cradle to cradle when you think about how is it moving through that. So if I'm company X, let's say Ford Motor Company, and somebody tells me I'd like to know your cradle to gate greenhouse gas emissions. That means the stuff that came before you until it got to your factory gate. It doesn't mean what happens afterwards, but cradle to cradle does. It means what happens afterwards. And these are important concepts in sustainability because it's about who has the responsibility in the supply chain for the environmental and social impacts. And if you say, I want you to be cradle to cradle responsible, that puts you in charge of a lot more things. That makes sense? Yeah. Uh, so once again, the people who are in the extractive industry are way at the beginning. You know, those people who are either mining things or agricultural companies or uh, people who are uh, silk farmers, you know, at the very beginning of those things, those people have a unique position, and I'm not saying if they got it right, everything else would fall in place. But those people have to get it right from an environmental and social point of view. Um, and the retail and business to business people have this unique uh, viewpoint because they see the consumption model. They see what the demand is. They see what the consumers, even if it is a business consumer, are interested in buying. And they'll be able to say to the producers of the things that they buy and put together in their own products, hey, our consumers are telling us that they don't want X in their product. What can you do to change it? So one of my first conversations that did not go well, actually, with was with America's largest paint company, and they didn't hire me. But they produced, at that time, zero environmentally conscious paints. This was probably 2008. And they wanted to get into environmentally conscious paints. And I don't know what their whole history is. Paint is basically water and chemicals. It's a problem. Hard to be environmentally conscious. But today, I've been watching, and their number one ad on television is about environmentally conscious sold to consumers, not businesses. So they heard the signals from the consumption folks saying consumers want that. So the business case is really important. It's you as a manager going in front of your boss or the CEO going to a lender or to an investor saying, hey, we want to invest in sustainability. And in particular, we have some things that are focused on supply chain which, by the way, nobody other than geeks like us know about. Um, and we want your money, or we want resources of people, or we need to collaborate with other companies, and I'd like you to okay it and green light it. And you're going to get peppered with tons of questions by whoever that person is who has to say yes. So what are the two things in supply chain sustainability really stick? Number one is risk management. So how do we avoid negative environmental impacts? 
back up the supply chain. Bosses are interested in hearing about that. They're, the world is still, no matter what politics there are or anything, the world is still generally very concerned about climate change, water, waste. That's not going away. Those things need to be addressed. And leading companies still are addressing those with lots of money and expertise. And not really so much out of the do-good feeling, but they don't want something bad happening. Similarly in social impacts, you know, I, I peg a lot of my work uh, in social impacts back on the Rana Plaza factory collapse in 2011. You do not want to be buying products that were responsible for 1,237 deaths. That just is not the way the world can go. And so there was something wrong in the working conditions, the monitoring, the business model there. Companies don't want that, consumers don't want it. So social impacts, labor, working conditions, slavery and supply chains, those are all today very large impacts. And then there's this governance issue of, you know, are we financially and ethically sound? Um, you know, there's Twitter today. You make one mistake and it'll be tweeted. And your risk is that consumers will flee. So number one, reputational risk, brand risk. You know, we saw your t-shirt on the Rana Plaza factory floor and it was tweeted everywhere. Um, supply risk, you know, we've chosen the wrong supplier who gets in trouble with a legal compliance issue and they're shut down and now we can't get the widgets that we need. Uh, and then legal risk, you know, there is a question that some courts in the world might start holding brands accountable for slavery and human rights abuses as a legal matter. To date, no. There's only direct relationship accountability. But the world may move in that direction, and you don't want to be the company that's found in that. But it's not just about risk. It's also about creating opportunities. And I, I you know, I'm so I'm the lawyer, I'm the risky, don't do it, don't do it. But it is essential that companies start to think about what are the opportunities in our supply chain? What do our suppliers know? Are they better than us? Can we go to our suppliers and say, if we wanted to come out with a green product, could you help us? Could you help us um, you know, make some sort of an innovative product that would create a new revenue stream for us? Could you help us reduce costs? You know, is, is approaching the sustainability question also gonna help us reduce costs? Uh, what about value capture? Big deal today in particularly high value product supply chains. Environmental issues of thrown out materials are paramount concern. Electronics leaches, there's strong regulatory le leaches when it's rained on, if it's in a landfill. There's strong regulatory regimes about this. You want to get rid of that compliance issue. But there's also money in thrown out electronics. And as resources become more scarce, commodity prices are going up. So you want to get the tin back out. You want to get the gold back out, the plating out of electronics. Those things have value instead of throwing them out. And the other thing is, you all want to get employed. And survey after survey shows that young people don't want to work for companies that aren't paying attention to sustainability. So you can differentiate yourself. You know, we're the green company. You could innovate with suppliers. You can collaborate with others or industry groups. And you can share value up and down the supply chain. Good news is, it's time for our first quiz. So I'd like to open the floor to have, I have six examples here. We don't have time to go through all. I'll pick three. And I want you to m match the scandal with the type of risk it represents. So let's do Rana Plaza. Okay, skip the VW thing. So somebody shout out one of the types of risks that Rana Plaza. Does everybody know what the Rana Plaza 
factory problem was? No. So garment producers in uh, Bangladesh uh, were awarded a Walmart contract and contract from others to produce t-shirts. They took it knowing they didn't have the capacity to sew that many t-shirts. And they offloaded part of that order onto a company that was on Walmart's no-no list because it had been in bad shape before. And it was located on the eighth floor, which was built illegally, of a uh, uh, factory kind of in the central part of Dakar and it was it was teetering for years and there's all sorts of corruption and, and I don't know how the guy the owner got the factory built up to eight stories but it collapsed during working hours and 1,237 people were killed and somebody snapped a picture of a Walmart t-shirt what type of risk is that to Walmart Reputational. Reputational. Brand. Yeah. Like I said, probably not legal risk at this point, but maybe someday. Uh, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola bought Honest Tea. Honest Tea is this groovy, kind of sustainable, recycled uh, glassware uh, business. What is that? What is Coke doing by buying Honest Tea? Differentiation. Differentiation. Right. We're Coke, but we've also got this groovy kind of thing. Um, and finally, Intel, the chip producer. So they led a, an industry group, this is the Electronics Industry Citizenship Coalition, to try to tease out what the problems were in conflict minerals. Who knows what conflict minerals are? Uh-oh. So there are four minerals that are mined primarily in this world in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a very nasty place. People are beheading each other, there's rape that's basically part of the culture, and there are these warlords that own the mines. So you do not want to be buying from the warlords. Unfortunately, that's most of the mines. And guess what? You can't tell one piece of tin when it's coming out of the uh, earth from the other one. So you don't know which was mined in a good, mine or which was a warlord mine because you intel are buying from a broker which just says i bought you 15 tons of tin oh could you get the one that's the good oh no we don't know so they went out and they started to work with the industry to tease out how do we know which is which by the way they do know now so what's that Collaboration. Okay, good. Everybody's aware. Okay, how do companies identify the risks that they have in their supply chain? The universe of these risks is really large. It is astounding. And nobody is going to go, just like they're not going to go through their whole supply base on day one, they're not going to say, we're going to start a sustainability program that in five years has tackled every one of these issues. If you say that, you're absolutely nuts and you're lying to somebody. You have to pick what's important. The next slide's going to talk about well, how to do that. But as you can see, we have really these three buckets. And in, um, in the world of pointers... Uh, no, it won't be visible. Oh, I'm, I'm over here. Right, I can't do it. Uh, this is called ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance. That's something you'll hear about sustainability. How are com companies doing on their ESG? There are a lot of terms that fly around here, but that's one to remember. So how are they doing on environmental performance, both internally and in their supply chain? How much water are they using? I would say after greenhouse gases, that's the and climate change. That's the world's number two problem. It might be the world's number one problem because two fifths of the world population on a daily basis do not have access to clean drinking water. That is a crime against humanity. It has to be changed. I mean, it sends shivers down my spine every time I say it. It is wrong, and. 
They're real challenges that are systemic and policy, but some of it is corporate behavior. So that needs to change. Social issues, as we talked, everything from empowering communities. So one of the things that Chiquita Banana does is they're in it for the long haul. They buy everything they can from subsistence farmers. Those are the people who farm bananas. So it's about paying the farmer a fair price. It's about going in and working with communities about health care, about education, about sustainable living for themselves, empowering those people so that Chiquita is known as a good player and people want to keep selling the bananas to Chiquita. And then the internal governance issues. The biggest issue today is transparency, particularly in supply chain sustainability. How do we know who are our suppliers? Okay, we can look in the database and we get a bunch of company names. Some of those companies, by the way, are bigger than us. Always an interesting issue. But they buy from other people and they're not gonna tell us who they buy from. So how do we even know to go back to what we call tier two in the supply chain, tier one being your direct suppliers, tier two to ask them questions about environmental and social impacts. We don't know what the companies are. How do we govern in a responsible way upstream? So this is the universe that companies have to look at. Yes. Uh, not very widespread here, but in Europe they have these uh, environmental product declarations. Yes. That it just compile the history and you can choose among Correct. with this. Interesting point. So EPDs, environmental product declarations, are for all intents and purposes the nerdy supply chain product environmental, generally, related equivalent of the thing that you see on food that gives you the calories and, uh, and fat content, that's right. It's like, what are the environmental impacts on a label? They're actually forms, but, so it forces the company to go through and go upstream and start collecting that data. It's really hard and really expensive. There's several companies that are experts in this. In Europe, it's, it's getting more common. There are some U.S. producers of goods that are starting to do that. Puma, Nike, the big ones, Patagonia does it. A lot of apparel people. But you can't go and buy a shirt. You know, this purple shirt versus that purple shirt. Today, we don't have the ability to make, as a consumer, the choice on the basis of the product attributes yet. So how do you prioritize out of all that stuff? So the first thing is you do a landscape scan. And I don't mean the physical landscape, I mean the issues landscape. So this is a real nuts and bolts slide. This is a step-by-step -step thing that they do. So before we go to the nuts and bolts, everybody have any questions? Okay. So this is how a team of managers or people who are responsible for this in a company are going to do this. They're going to assemble what we call a cross-functional team. So there'll be somebody from uh, R&D. There'll be somebody from operations. There'll be somebody from supply chain, somebody from finance, somebody from marketing. And they're going to sit around. They're going to do a high-level analysis of that list. Do we think our product or our industry probably has one of those problems? And I guarantee you, even with that high-level analysis, without a ton of education, because we've gotten as far as we've gotten <coughs> now, you'll be able to get rid of a lot of the things. You know, certain industry, everybody's got climate change issues. That one you probably can't get rid of. But certain industries, because their labor kind of structure, don't have slavery issues in their supply chain. It just doesn't generally exist. So you can take that one off the table there. So they're going to do that scan. And they're going to do it by industry, geography, and they're going to get people like me to come in and help them do that analysis, that high-level scan. And then they're going to say, okay, all those things we think are possible. But now the question is, where do we think those things are? Are they internal issues? 
Are they at that tier one? It's our direct suppliers where we think those problems are? Or do we really need to start thinking further up, tier one and beyond? So that is the scope of our inquiry. So subject matters and then the scope. Actually, they're both, you could use the word scope in both cases. Subsidiaries, companies, you know, have complex business models today. What about 50-50 joint ventures between two companies? Which one's going to run that? So you have to figure that out. So they're going to talk through all of that, and then they're going to come up with a laundry list. And they're going to link that laundry list to what a large group of stakeholders in their business tell them what's important. So internally, they first came up with some ideas. Let's say they came up with 10. The next slide I'm going to show you has a lot more than 10. But let's say they came up with 10. Then they're going to do focus groups. They're going to go do reading of industry things. They're literally going to do focus groups, like in this room. Um, and they're going to reach out to suppliers, customers, um, and all of these stakeholders do what we call a materiality assessment. So the word materiality is a little bit of a quirky, geeky thing. It comes from the world of finance, which says something is not reportable in the public domain as a financial matter unless it's material. Many years ago, the Supreme Court was asked, what does material mean? And they answered anything that to a reasonable investor would make them either buy or not buy the stock. So something that influences decision. So that's not exactly the same as what it is in sustainability, but for some reason we decided to use this term and people hate it. Um, so now we're thinking of things like relevant or influential as instead of material. But right now it's still called a materiality analysis. So they're looking for um, stakeholders to weigh in on their list and say, we really do care about greenhouse gases in your company and in your industry. So guess what? You ever screw up on that? We're never buying another one. If you're not disclosing it, we're not going to invest in your company. They'll get all this feedback. And that will put greenhouse gases up near the top of the list. And they literally assign scores. Many companies, particularly large companies, do this with software and databases um, that can assign a score. And they will slice and dice that at the end of the day, and they will come up with what's called a materiality map, which this one, unfortunately, is small, and it's going to scare the hell out of you because there's all this stuff going on. But basically what we have here is a grid that maps all of those issues on how important it is to stakeholders to how important the internal team thought it was the business. Because part of their first landscape scan is also assessing from the internal group. This is probably there, but if it were, it's not so important, or it is important. So it's a matrix issue. So I know you can't read these. Unfortunately, that's just the, the situation here. So here's one that's called ethics and integrity. Kind of a sustainability issue. It's akin to it. It's how ethical are you as a business and what's your business integrity like? Do, are you trans, well, transparency is probably different. But you know, do you cheat on your taxes kind of a thing. And so they said, you know, importance to the business not very far out. But stakeholders said, oh, yes, it is. So it ends up in this quadrant. So you start mapping these, and you put a quad on there, and you get four quads. Quad one is stuff, and you use a different strategic approach to each of these quads. You get your materiality map, and you say, now we kind of have an idea of where, how, where these issues play out. Because we've got to figure out where to work first. We can't tackle all this. Well, guess where you're working first? Quad four. This stuff's both important to your business success and important to your stakeholders. So these dots over here, energy use, uh, product design, energy efficiency, social and environmental issue. This is an actual company. Um, education, recycling, greenhouse gas emissions, Compensation, network and data security, 
Uh, this happens to be Vodafone, the uh, British telecommunications company. That all ended up in here. Disaster response, you, you might think, oh my god, you're a telecommunications company. What if you know, all your towers blow up? You better have a good disaster response. The company kind of thought that had it covered, but like I said, the stakeholder said, we don't want our phone lines to go down, so you better be paying attention to it. So here, you keep these people satisfied. I'm not saying you don't do any work on that issue, but out of all the things that you work on, you do less, and you'll devote fewer resources to it, at least right now. And you need to keep doing these. The world's static. Your business changes. You may acquire another business. You may get out of a business. You can't do this once every 50 years. It's probably once every three-year exercise. And if you're a really smart company, you're doing this constantly. The Unilevers, the Patagonias, they're doing this constantly. They are reaching out to every stakeholder they can, including, I mean, they go talk to futurists to try to figure out where these things are trending. Are they come to people like me? What are you seeing? What's, what is it that we don't know that we should know? Because billions of dollars are at stake and lives. How many people have seen pictures uh, side by side pictures of rivers in China that change color from one day to the next. You ever seen that picture? Yeah, because of the dye that's being used that day to dye apparel. We don't want a world that's like that. That's a problem. So, you know, we've got to be serious about fixing these things. And is that GAP's responsibility? Is it, where is this suit from? I think I bought this at, so this is Saks Fifth Avenue. I bought this at a oh, fancy consultant. Um, and so uh, is it the retailer? Is it Saks's responsibility to make sure those rivers aren't getting polluted? How many boats Saks should invest money into making sure the river isn't polluted? Or, or if you were a shareholder, you might raise that issue. How many vote for Saks? So some people would extend the responsibility all the way to the retailer. How many people think it's the uh, brand that happens to be Calvin Klein? I bought it at Sex. It's Calvin Klein. How many people think it's Calvin Klein? Okay. Some people think it's Calvin Klein, which, by the way, is a license. If there is no Calvin Klein manufacturer. Calvin Klein is a license, so you got to go back to wherever that license was granted for that suit manufacturer. So that's the complexity of that business model. So somebody's got to find out who has got the suit license from Calvin Klein. Okay, how many people think it's that manufacturer? Wherever that is. Okay. So it's that manufacturer. So I happen to have a bunch of apparel clients, so this is an interesting thing. Um, Okay, that manufacturer is a contract manufacturer in suburban Hong Kong, because I actually have some, which is actually across the border in China. So it's in Shenzhen province or somewhere near there, Guangdong. And it's trucked to Hong Kong and then distributed around the world. Uh, that contract manufacturer is just a cut and sew operation. They didn't die any of it. They got pre-dyed material, and they cut and sewed it into a suit. How many still want to hold them responsible? Nobody. What if I told you they were the largest purchaser in the world of that material and had 100% leverage over the supplier of that? Now do you want to hold them more responsible? How many people think that I could call Saks and ask them to go back to the uh, to the mill where the product was made, the fabric was made and dyed, and uh, Saks could actually know which mill that was. Not that. Because you're right, they don't. And big, big brands sometimes have long-standing relationships and they call out. But in general, they don't care where it comes from as a business matter. They spec a certain thing. General Motors wants a bolt 
for the car. It can come from you, me, anybody. It has a specification, it has a price. This is the way we've done business for a year, price, quality, delivery. Now you're saying environmental and social. Uh-oh, we've never asked that. How do we start finding out back up there what's environmental and social? So we're going to work here. We're going to monitor here. Uh, we're going to, here we're kind of monitoring things. We're going to lightly monitor what's going on here. Over here we better closely monitor because it matters to our business a lot. But this stuff kind of doesn't matter to either our business or stakeholders, according to that material analysis. Give me an example of a tactic you use if you want to keep, if your issue showed up and keep satisfied. What would you do? I'm a stakeholder up in quadrant one. You want to keep me satisfied about an issue I care a lot. Apparently you don't. How do you keep me satisfied? Monitoring, measuring. Monitoring and measuring. And what do you do with the results? Just keep track. You keep track internally. How do I know about it? I'm this external stakeholder. Uh, Are I'll you sending me a report? Mm. I'll, I will I wouldn't say a report, I would say like you know, good communication with the stakeholders, but not a report in that in that stage. Okay. You're kind of on, on I, I get what you're saying. You don't want to get into a detailed report. So, you know, they're publicly facing documents. A lot of times they'll have some sort of glossy thing that says, we're working on greenhouse gases. That's about all they say. What if you wanted to meaningfully engage this I'll skip for time purposes, but you can think this is kind of a spectrum, right? Here you're doing a little less in the middle. What if you really wanted to meaningfully engage with that supplier? I'm the supplier. I know that was a technology company. Let's say it was an apparel company. And the river issue was important to both you and your stakeholders. So you want to engage on this issue of the dyed fabric. How would you engage on it? What would you do? You'd probably send a representative. Um, Where? Um, to them face to face. So you have a close interaction. And you probably try to sell them on the value of um, keeping or, or executing like doing actions to get whatever is in that closet up the line. So I have a question. Who's them? Who are you going to? Uh, stakeholders for the for the thing. So the issue is the die thing. Yes. I'm the stakeholder yelling, I want something done about that. Yes. Okay. Because I don't like the fact that the dying of that. So the uh, what I'm trying to raise here is how do you know who to go to? Because there are people who scout, my New York office used to be next to the R&D Center for Abercrombie and & Fitch. And there were all these, excuse me, millennials who are hired to just go out in the world. And they go and they look at trends. And they were always in Scandinavia or Iceland, because that's where fashion trends were going. And they'd come back and say, you know, everybody's talking about having boots with no petroleum-based uh, uh, soles. And up there, they won't buy them. They won't buy outdoor work boots if they have uh, glues in them that are petroleum-based. What are we going to do? You know, there's somebody in Abercrombie and Fitch who's like a product person around boots. By the way, they licensed boots, so they didn't make them. So that didn't work. But they got to go find the person who's gluing the damn thing on the bottom. They don't know who that person is. So you've got to go way, way back. And that's the transparency problem. You don't know. So Abercrombie might not be, if you're the stakeholder who's crying foul about this, and you're calling Abercrombie because you don't like the boot, you're an Icelandic person, and you don't want to buy that boot, but you love Abercrombie, and you call Abercrombie and say, stop selling boots with that glue in it. And Abercrombie's going to say, we'll try, but we don't know who puts the glue on. 
and it's a legitimate issue. But you're right. The idea is to get to whoever that is and meaningfully have a conversation about, you could sell a whole lot more boots, Mr. Shoe Gluer, if the glue didn't have toxic stuff in it. So one of the ways it does that is that EICC example, industry coalitions. Everybody gets together and pulls the resources and starts to go upstream because they all kind of share the same suppliers. Guess what? There are only so many people in the world that make shoe glue. And they'll figure it out. But probably one company can't. Industry coalitions are an example of a tactic that you use for meaningful engagement. So how do you, sorry, examples of supply chain sustainability strategy, I've given you a few, but let's talk about a few more. So number one is codes of conduct. You have a written document with your supplier that says, do this and don't do that. And if you do what we didn't like, you're probably gonna get canned at some point. Nobody cans them right away because it becomes a big problem. How do we get it from somebody else? But it's a supplier-facing document that calls out the expectations. Don't pollute, don't buy uh, environmental laws, no slavery in your supply chain, uh, keep on top of uh, living wages, blah, blah, blah. There are a lot of companies that don't have these. Surprise, surprise. The leading companies have them, but I'm out there writing code, codes of conduct for companies that you would think would have them. They don't have, they haven't communicated their expectations to their supplier group. But once they do, that puts in start, start in place, first of all, they have to sign them. Oh, now I have a legal obligation of some sort. Um, and there's some minimum call outs, usually don't violate laws, but sometimes they're a little higher. And then you also put that same language in every request for a proposal that you send out. If you can't do that, don't bid. And by the way, when you go to sign the contract, it's also in the contract. And legal in your company as a supplier will get the contract and they will scan through it and say, hmm, has anybody looked at this paragraph about what it's requir requiring us? Oh no, we haven't. Oh no, we can't do that. We can't sign that contract. Trust me, it doesn't happen at that point. They will have looked at it. Um, so you start to put it in all these gateway mechanisms about who you want to do business with. The other thing you do is manage your suppliers against those expectations. This is highly complex. With even a few hundred suppliers, it's very hard. There are scorecards. Go to pgsupplier.com, PG is Procter & Gamble, that's their supplier portal, you can go to it, and you can click on supplier code and scorecard, and they will show you the scorecard that they use. And they will show you, it, it, the one that's up there is an example, and it has numbers. They will not show you the algorithm of what their internal expectations are and how they came up with the numbers, that's the secret sauce. But they will show you, okay, here are the 10 things that we measure our suppliers on. And they have it there on public, and per on, uh, on public display on purpose. So that suppliers who want to do business with P&G know what they're in for. Plus, P&G has given that scorecard away to every company on the planet. That's kind of interesting. I'm a supplier. Every year I'm going to get called in and I'm going to get a 95. I was a supplier to a very large wholesale company. I got a 96. I was the CEO when they called me in. They didn't call the supply chain for a 96. They called me in. It wasn't an environmental issue. It was a product quality issue. But companies take that scorecard seriously. And their thing was you get to 99 within a quarter or you're no longer a supplier and we'll get that product from somebody else. So there's a lot of leverage in those scorecards. Uh, audits. How many people know that companies go out and audit suppliers on environmental and social issues? And how many think that's valuable? <laughs> it's not. I mean, I hate to be very cynical about it, but suppliers know auditors are coming. They know the auditors. In China, there is an industry of rental fire extinguishers. 
Absolutely, not kidding you, because they know the game. And they don't generally want to go out and buy fire extinguishers. So they know, oh, it's been about 12 months since the auditors were here. So for the next month, we'll rent fire extinguishers in case they show up. They show up, they're gone. Uh, audits are, you know, the only, so that's audit trickery. The only ones that are any good are un unannounced, done by independent third parties. You don't want to go in there as the company because you don't want to get into a shouting match. You go get a reputable auditor. It's very hard to do because local auditors are often tied to those other companies. So I don't believe in this part is really solving our sustainability dilemma. It's done by every company. But I don't happen to believe that's where we need to be. I think it's about investing in our supply base. It's about creating incentives for our suppliers to do better. It's about awarding them. Trust me, an award to a supplier means a lot. It sounds goofy, it's a plaque, it's a dinner, it's at a, an award ceremony. It means something to be recognized for this. Maybe 20 years from now it won't because everybody will be doing it. But right now, to get a green supplier year of the year award, it's a big deal. Preferred bid status. You, because you're so good, we call you first to offer you new business. That's an incentive. And that takes some sort of management work in the supply organization, which would normally have some other criteria to go out and send stuff to bid. To say, whoops, hold on, before you send that out, Let's see if there's anybody on our preferred list because of their environmental and social performance. And finally, mentor. Spend the time talking to your suppliers about what your expectations are and what their capacity is to meet those. And if they don't have the capacity, hook them up with me and pay for it. Send them to an industry group, a local nonprofit organization, give them access to expertise, Walmart, which a lot of people get very angry about because its huge consumption model is not particularly environmentally or socially sustainable, holds one of the largest packaging forums in the world every other year. So you show up in Bentonville, Arkansas at your own expense, and they have a whole giant warehouse full of packaging experts and suppliers. You're a supplier of Walmart. Walmart's told you, we want your packaging to be better stronger, less weight, easier to open, no toxins, laundry list of stuff. They've already had that conversation with you. And if you do, you'll get more business. And probably five years from now, if you don't, you're not getting any business. But that's the stick. But they give you a carrot. You get access to those packaging suppliers. You're the battery guy, right? You're selling Duracell to Walmart. Walmart buys a lot of Duracell batteries, millions. And if the person, the category manager at Walmart who buys batteries, calls Duracell and says, we're not happy with your packaging and we want you to change, it's one thing to end the conversation there. It's another thing to say, and next year, you're going to come to our packaging showcase and we're going to help you do that. That's a totally different mindset and it creates a totally re different relationship between supplier and customer. And that's what has to happen in order to change supplier behavior. You can whip them all you want. And, and some of that stick needs to be there. But companies need to start thinking it's not all about you're the bad guy. We want better. Some, you need to say that to some of your suppliers. But some of it is, we want better and we'll help you. We're in it for the long haul. This is a relationship. You screw up and you're gone, but this is a relationship. Two key things that are happening, and this segues into this, is something called responsible sourcing. So at the beginning, we're going to go out, and rather than buying from everybody, we're going to responsibly source. We're going to say what matters to us, and we're only going to look at suppliers and their goods and services that matter to us. So there's a lot of upfront work defining what that is. 
but we're going to avoid suppliers that have known risks. We're going to steer the money we spend towards suppliers that have these attributes that we want. And there are knowledge bases out there of what that should look like. Because a lot of companies say, well, what would it really look like to be a responsible buyer of this stuff? We don't even know. This is sourcing. So sourcing comes before buying. This is identifying who you might buy the stuff from. We need widgets. Where, where in the world will we go get a widget? Well, we can buy it on price or quality, or we can buy it with some of these other attributes. And we think about that up front. It's intentional, and it's part of our business model. You can Google responsible sourcing, and you'll get millions of hits, because it's a big deal right now. Sustainable procurement is a little bit further on. That's saying we are only going to buy environmentally and socially friendly uh, uh, goods and services from responsible suppliers. So there are two aspects. What's in the stuff and what's the behavior of the company we buy it from? And you need to pay attention to both those things because you can buy the greenest product in the world from a company that has the worst ethical practices. You don't want that. And likewise, you can go, go to, you know, the gold crown of companies and buy toxic chemicals. So you need to pay attention to both. And there are ways that we're now starting to work on to frame that out. And generally, we frame it by category. Like, what does responsible timber look like? So one thing that SPLC, which I'm on the advisory council too, is doing is looking like forest products. So let's look at forest products and what do responsible forest products look like? So that when somebody's in a company and they know that forest products go into what they're buying, they have some sort of framework that's mutually agreed upon. These are big working groups full of you know, 20, 30 experts and outside advisors, and it takes a year to come up with it. Um, but this is a big deal now. Preferable purchasing programs uh, are very similar, but what they do is they come up with a roadmap and they say if you meet the roadmap, you are number one on our supplier list. Two strategies companies might use to communicate expectations back to suppliers. What would you do? This suit will stick with this. I don't want to see the river change color when you've done a blue suit on one day and you've done a black suit. How would you communicate that? This is a little tough because I know this isn't your thing, but I just want you to think through one way to do it would be to get leverage. Go form an industry group that you can all speak to publicly, perhaps, in the press, surprise, surprise, or through investor groups, back to that supplier. Uh, manage supplier performance, we talked about scorecards, incentives, uh, and purchase responsibly, that is really about setting that framework about the goods and services and the suppliers. Very quickly, you need to collect a lot of data about this stuff. This is tough stuff. You need to say, what does success look like? Like every other thing in business. You have to establish key performance indicators or metrics. So what is a green company by our standards? Oh, it's one with less than two tons of carbon dioxide per dollar of sales. And you need to start measuring that. Companies only do what they manage, what they measure. It's very data driven. But the problem is, in the social arena, arena, what does a healthy employee look like? What's a happy employee look like? What does a fulfilled indigenous person look like? It's not a number. So that tends to be a quantitative issue, that polling, that's going out and working with NGOs that work with indigenous people and say, spend six months with our uh, cocoa supplier and find out what's going on with the people. 
not so easy to do because you go into the fields and the boss is right over there. And maybe the people who work in the fields don't want to say anything. But you collect this. And the other problem we have here is you collect data about what's happening. But some of these results in the social arena, health, well-being, that's a 20-year payout. You can't measure them today. You can measure what the activity is, but are people getting healthier because of what you're doing? And if so, over how long? You have real problems around collecting that data and managing it. You know, I told you to do it for six months. Well, by the time you send it back to the corporate headquarters, it's already six months old because you were in the field for six months. You only saw 10% of the cocoa farmers. Is that representative of all cocoa farmers? I don't know. Um, can you verify it? Can I go back and say to the pollster, I want to see uh, or hear the actual interviews? No, we didn't record anything. Well, how do I know? These are big issues today around data security, who owns data, not just for sustainability. I just My last newsletter was about this. It's really data is becoming a huge issue to sustainability management. And just like data has issues in other things, it has it in sustainability. Security, who owns the data? That car you're driving, that app in the car, wasn't developed by the car manufacturer. It's either a Google app, Nokia, the tech people do that. Who owns the data that app is collecting when you press it in there? Does the car manufacturer own that, or does Google own it? They're fighting about this right now. So similarly, when you start to put data in, uh, technology in around collecting sustainability data, who owns it? The technology? person who sold you the software, or do you own? We won't do this quiz, and I will thank you. <laughs>